Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Welcome to another episode of Questions and Answers from Quarantine with me, Chris McMichael. This is episode number 12 now, and I just received a question today that I thought I would take as a challenge. They said, um, this may be a little bit longer teaching, but I would love to hear the rewards taught from the He That Overcometh series in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. And so, yes, that is in fact a little bit longer of a teaching, but I think we're up for it. So... If you're not familiar with the reference of the overcoming or the overcoming series of rewards in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, well, this is a reference to the writings of Jesus Christ through John the Revelator to the seven churches of the apocalypse that are referenced there in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. These are what I consider to be micro epistles, seven churches all in Asia Minor or what is modern day Turkey. And all these churches are about 30 miles apart, almost in a perfect circular uh, ring. So we're not dealing with churches all over the world. We're dealing with seven different churches, all about 30 miles apart from each other, all written at the same time, and all of them facing different issues, each church with its own personality, each church with its own pastor, each church with its own strengths and its own weaknesses, each church running simultaneously their race for the Lord, and the Lord having something to say to them differently. This passage is interpreted and applied differently by a lot of different preachers and eschatologists. I like to take the eschatological interpretation that we are addressing churches at that time in history, but also ideas or characteristics that can be applied to churches today. And also we can see the strengths and weaknesses that are at any church at any given time. I think at any given time, Any church can be somewhat like the Ephesian church or somewhat like the Sardis church or somewhat like the Pergamos church or the Thyatira church. I personally reject the notion that these are the seven churches throughout time and that we're now in the last day's church, which is the Laodicean church, the lukewarm church, because that doesn't fit the church universal around America. Uh, Yes, we could probably describe America as the Laodicean lukewarm church, but that doesn't describe the Chinese church right now. It doesn't describe the, um, the Iran church or the North Africa church, these persecuted churches. Not at all. So that's, that's a bad model and a bad application. I don't even think it's a progression of showing how a church matures and then peters out. Because then it's saying it ebbs and flows between seasons of I lost my love, then I went into persecution, then I had bad doctrine, then I was a coward, then I had a bad testimony, then I was persecuted again, and that ended up lukewarm. That, that, just, doesn't, that just doesn't jive with the church history, not even the Western church, which is what most folks who apply this model of their eschatological application to. Anyway, all that aside, that's a little bit of uh, eschatology application hermeneutic. Let's look at the seven churches of the apocalypse. Let's look at their overcoming promises. Because there's going to be a really cool pattern that develops here that I think will help us. So Revelation chapter 2 verse, uh, uh, verse 7 is written to the Ephesians church. That's the first of the seven churches. And it says, uh, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Verse 7, what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of of the paradise of God. Now here's the deal, and this is what the pattern I want us to watch for as we cover these seven churches very quickly. The main issue at the church of Ephesus was that they had lost their first love. They were no longer hungry for God. They had everything else legalistically set up, but they were no longer hungry for God. Okay, you see that? No longer hungry for God. But if they overcome that lack of hunger, to him will I give to eat. Now here's, what I, here's the principle I want to set forth to you. Each one of these overcoming rewards addresses the temptation or the sin or the weakness that they were battling in the church. Every one of these seven rewards is different, but they are the antithesis because they are the overcomer's award. They're overcoming something. And if you overcome what you were struggling with, what you get is the exact opposite of what you were struggling with. Watch that pattern play out. If the Ephesians church overcomes their 
their lack of hunger for God, Jesus Christ will give them to eat of the tree of life. It's the last thing you want if you're not hungry for God. But the reward for somebody that overcomes a full appetite is eating of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Number two church, the church of Smyrna. The church at Smyrna is under intense tribulation. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia are under persecution and pressure, whereas the church of Smyrna is tribulation. The church of Philadelphia is temptation. You could argue that it's kind of the same, but they are different flavors. So they're battling an intense tribulation. He says that, uh, talks about they dwell where the synagogue of Satan is. Fear not those things which thou shalt suffer. So we're talking about suffering. And behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and you will be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So we see that what the Smyrna church is going through is persecution, death, imprisonment, extreme persecution, being crushed and losing their life. So what's their reward if they overcome all of this? Verse 11, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes tribulation, death, persecution, imprisonment. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So that reward is the total opposite of overcoming the first problem, which is a fear of death, fear of losing your life, denying Christ. He says, listen, be faithful, overcome this, and I will reward you with never being touched by the second death. We see that that reward is the antithesis of what that church was facing. Now let me interject here. I believe all these rewards apply to us once we finish our race and we overcome. He that endures to the end shall be saved, and these are the promises to the overcomers. Now I also want to throw out there before we move on, that to him that overcomes, which implies, it is inferred, that not everybody that Jesus is writing to through the Apostle John is going to overcome. And that should make us pause and wonder, so everybody in the early churches, even those being persecuted, not everyone was going to overcome? Evidently not, because it said to those who do. And to those who do would imply that not all will. All right. Third church, Pergamos. Pergamos' issue was horrible doctrine. <laughs> He talked about, God said, I got a couple of things against you. Really two massive things. You got Balaam doctrine and you got Nicolaitan doctrine. The Pergamos church is what I call the church of bad doctrine. He said, so I have somewhat against you. You got some good things going for you, Pergamos, but there's a couple of things I have against you. You let those that hold the doctrine of Balaam, which is all about fornication and eating meat sacrificed unto idols, and you hold those that have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which God says, I hate Evidently, the problem here is that the pastor, the church of Pergamos, is afraid to confront bad doctrine. So their church is infiltrated with loose, carnal, sensual doctrine. Nicolaitan doctrine is what we would call hyper-grace doctrine. It's a doctrine that says the Gospels are too legalistic. Uh, it's, uh, the Nicolaitans were loose-living Christians who said, grace, 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 and who are you to judge? Watch this. He says, Repent or I will come quickly and fight against you. Verse 17 is the reward if they overcome their problem. What's their problem? Bad doctrine, bad teaching. Verse 17, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Hidden manna. What is manna? It's the bread of life. It's pure doctrine. It's the bread that comes down from heaven. It's not the teachings of Balaam. It's not the te teachings of Nicholas. Those who hold to the teachings of Balaam and those that hold to the teachings of Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans, they are disciples of Balaam and disciples of Nicholas. If you'll overcome this, you're going to get real manna, not this baloney, phony baloney teaching, and you'll get a white stone and a stone with a new name written in it. So you're going to be proven that you actually belong to God you don't belong to Nicholas. You don't belong to Balaam. That is the antithesis of the problem they were struggling with. Can you see the pattern so far developing? Every reward promised to the overcomer is the exact opposite. They had to overcome what they were struggling with, and the reward is the reward that is the opposite of their struggles. Fourth church is the church of Thyatira. This is the church I call the non-confrontational church. This is a pastor being nailed to the wall because he refuses to confront Jezebel. Some interpretations of uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 18 imply 
that, excuse me, um, in verse 20, that it says, you notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because you suffer that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. The word woman and the word wife are the same word in the Greek, but it is the, um, uh, the contextual clues that kind of lend to us how we are to interpret it. So some translations actually say, because you permit your wife, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. So it's possible that the pastor of the church at Thyatira was too cowardly, much like the original Ahab, to rein his wife in and to rein her in to be submissive to his leadership and his husbanding, regardless of whether that's the accurate interpretation. Either way, the pastor of Thyatira is a coward. And he is allowing a woman who thinks she's a prophetess, God calls her a Jezebel, to teach people and to run amok. That's the key. He refuses to exercise his dominion, straighten out the chaos in his church, and he allows an unlawful person to run amok and destroy God's vineyard of the local church. That's the problem in Thyatira. So we should expect the reward to be the total opposite of not confronting a tyrant who is running amok with stolen leadership. We should expect that to be the reward for that overcoming. Verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him, I will give power over the nations, or authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a the rod of iron. Wow. So that's the total opposite of this pastor at Ephesus, excuse me, Thyatira. He is not ruling over his church well, and he certainly is not ruling it with a rod of iron. The problem at Thyatira is a cowardly pastor who is allowing someone to steal authority and teach God's people perverse things. And God does not want that. But if you can overcome it, you get to be so much better than that as a reward in the millennial reign. Revelation chapter 3, we move on to our fifth church, the church of Sardis. The pro I call Sardis the unwatchful church, but really... What their problem is, is they have a testimony that they are great and that they have fruit. But the Lord says, I've searched thee and I found that these things are not true. So they're an unwatchful church, but they're coasting off of a past reputation that they are a glorious church full of magnificent works and glory and splendor. And he says, um, he says in verse 1, I know your, name, your works, and I know your name that thou livest, but you are dead. Or we would say your reputation that you're alive, but I know that you're really dead. Be watchful and strengthen things which remain that, they, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. So the biggest work here, or the biggest problem is that the church of Sardis has a false testimony. Everybody in the community thinks they're awesome. Everybody in the churches thinks the Sardis church is the bee's knees, but this is truly not the case. Outside, they're corrupt. They look polished, but on the inside, they're corrupting rapidly. So we should expect that church, if it overcomes, to have a reward that's the total opposite of that. And sure enough, in verse 5, he says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, which is not what they currently had. They, God saw them as filthy. And I will, blot, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his, his angels. And so we see there again, there's this reward, the overcoming. You overcome lukewarmness, or you overcome these dirty robes, you overcome this bad testimony in the eyes of God. If you overcome it, you get for sure a white robe. You get for sure not to have your name blotted out. You get for sure to have your name confessed before God Almighty and his holy angels. Because the community called the church one thing, but Jesus Christ said, I call you something else. And let me, let me take a little moment on that. It honestly does not matter what the community calls us. What matters ultimately is what God calls us. It's wonderful if both the community and God can line up. But probably more often than not, in the days that we live in, the community and God aren't going to be saying the same thing about the same church. And here we see they had a reputation that they were a wonderful church, but that's not what God thought of them. If they overcome that shallow community reputation, they would get a white robe and a name confessed before God Almighty, which evidently is not what they had at the moment. They had a dirty robe that everybody in the community seemed to like. All right, moving on to church number six. That's the Philadelphia church. 
The Philadelphia church is dealing with temptation, not so much tribulation and persecution, but temptation. And he says there in verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And um, let's see, what do I identify them as? The patient church, the word keeping church is what would I call them. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwelleth upon the earth. We also see that uh, there are those of the synagogue of Satan that lie, that he will cause them to come and fall down at their feet and worship and to know that that church is loved of God. So what we're seeing here is a church that's under tribulation, temptation, and, and trials they're being buffeted, they're wobbling, and Jesus is encouraging them to keep patience and to endure temptation. So obviously they're, they're weak here, they're kind of wobbling, they're, they're facing pressure, they're not a dirty church, they're not a compromised church, they're just under pressure and they're wobbling. And he's telling them, keep the word of my patience, I will keep you in the hour of temptation, I'll come quickly, hold fast. These are all encouragements to shore up a wobbly church that loves God with all of its heart, but I just don't know if I can make it any longer. This is a good church. There's only two good churches in the Revelation and the seven churches of the Apocalypse, and that is Smyrna at the beginning, that's the persecuted church, and now we've got Philadelphia. They're not rebuked for anything. The other five churches carry a rebuke with them. These churches are under duress, but the Philadelphia church, where we're looking at right now, they're kind of wobbly. And if God says, if you'll overcome, wait, we should expect the reward to be the antithesis or the total opposite of a wobbly church that just doesn't know how much longer it can hang out. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar. Wow, that totally is the opposite of how this is, church is right now. A pillar, an immovable, solid fortitude, a, a, a support. Not exactly what they are right now. Their temptation is to quit. Their temptation is to retreat. Their temptation is to compromise. <laughs> he says, to them that overcome this, I will make them to be a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. That means no more waffling, no more wavering. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. It just speaks fortitude, acceptance, confidence, courage. And that's what the Philadelphia church was struggling to have. Hopefully you're seeing this pattern. It's a wonderful question. I appreciate somebody asking it. Last church, probably the most famous church of the seven churches, is the church of Laodicea. What's their problem? Arrogance and lukewarmness. They are the lukewarm church. And he says, uh, uh, it's just fun to see how he... He rebukes him. He says, you say you are rich. You say you're increased with goods. You say you have need of nothing. And you know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. How would you like Jesus Christ to show up at your church one Sunday morning and say, look, appreciate the laser light shows you got and the coffee bar and Jehovah Java and holy beans and everything you're doing around here and the 20 buses you're running and, and all the media content and social media this. But I think maybe that you're really probably wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the problem with this church. Furthermore, the problem is that Jesus reveals it. We think it's an evangelistic verse. It's not. Jesus reveals in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If this is an evangelistic verse, which we've used it to win the loss before, if this is an evangelistic verse, then what Jesus is saying is, I don't even go to your church anymore. Laodicea, I'm on the outside knocking. Please let me come in. Please let me come into your church. So we see quite easily what the problem is here. They're, they're not seated in heavenly places. They're, they're being close to being spewed out of the Lord's mouth. They're wretched, blind, miserable, poor, naked. So to him that overcomes, what would we expect? Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. To him that overcomes, <laughs> honestly, if I'm at the Laodicean church and I get this epistle from John the Revelator, I'm changing churches. Even if I'm the pastor, I'm changing churches. I'm going to a church that's hot for God. 
The antithesis to lay out a seeing is sitting and being who you are in Christ. And what's odd is to him that overcome will I grant to sit with me. I thought if you were born again, you were already seated in heavenly places. It does not appear that that applies to the Laodicean church at that moment. And that gets into a whole bunch of doctrinal stuff we've got to sort out because that's my doctrine. If you're born again, you're seated in heavenly places. That's Ephesians doctrine. But here we see they have to overcome all the lukewarmness, the deception, the carnality, the nakedness, the wretchedness, the blindness. And if they do overcome, to him, to him, to the individual members in that church that overcome the condition of Laodicea, I'll let them sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I think that's a pretty succinct answer to, can you explain the overcoming rewards of Revelation 2 and 3? Did it in 20 minutes, 45 seconds? I think that'll work. God bless you. We'll see you on the next episode, or you get to hear my voice on the next episode. In Jesus' name.